Welcome to the show, folks. Another edition of Pod Crash and a very special one. Uh, this week, I crash Film Threat. Uh, you've probably heard me discuss it on previous uh, episodes of this show. Uh, Film Threat is a magazine, started as a zine and then developed into a magazine, and now it's a website. And I did that thing. I, I was involved with Film Threat for 25 years. How many people you know did something for 25 years? I, it's, it's shocking to me. So I started this thing as a kid. And now it's a popular website. I'm no longer involved with the site. It's run by Mark Bell. But I have some very, I have something very special for Mark at the very end of the show. And you might want to listen in. Very special thing uh, for Mark Bell that I'll be doing at the, at the end of the show. But before we get to the Film Threat podcast crash, I have to address something that happened on last week's show. Last week, I reviewed the review that came from the podcast, Podcast Squared by Andrew Johnstone. And I, I thought that what I was doing was all in good fun. I think that Andrew thinks that I'm, I was actually really pissed off. I was, I was upset for about two seconds, but I wasn't actually really mad. I mean, I thought it was, I was actually trying to do something funny with the audio of his review. So I reviewed his review on my show. And I think I actually, there's a couple serious things. First of all, I think, I think you got to get a better microphone, Andrew. And then secondly, um, you have to have a rating system that anyone can understand. I don't know what subscribe narrowcast means, but I know what thumbs up, thumbs down means. I know what one through 10. I know five stars. I know a minus if you read entertainment weekly still, um, you got to have a rating system that makes sense to people that don't listen to podcasts all the time. And I think that that would be, but I think that would be better. But uh, I also think that, uh, what he's doing with this podcast is actually a service to the community. For, pe- for those of us who happen to love podcasts, and I listen to quite a few. Um, I'm always trying to find a new one that I can become addicted to and whatnot. But Andrew says that he was harassed by some of my listeners. So I have to say to some of you listening to this show, and I, I have to say I love you all. I really appreciate the fact that you download this and listen to it. And well, I don't care what device you're using. If you're, putting, if you're putting these audio waves of my voice inside you in some form, for that, I am grateful. I thank you, and I appreciate you continuing to listen. Um, but uh, t- t- apparently, some of you harassed him. And then I, I pressed further, and I asked Andrew, and he said, well, he got really one email from a douchebag. And I'm thinking, first of all, t- t- please, listeners, you don't need to be doing stuff like that, unless I ask you as a favor. But I don't think I directly ever asked that. But also, as a guy who did film threat for a long time, Welcome to the club, dude. I mean, look, Andrew, if you're going to be reviewing things, you're going to have some people that disagree with your opinion, and you got to take it. You know, if you're going to dish it out, you got to be able to take it. And I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten unsolicited emails from jerks or weird at replies on Twitter, which I can block that person forever, or just unsolicited creepy mail. And that happened quite a bit during my years at Film Threat. Um, so uh, to Andrew, I apologize. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. But also, I think it, I think maybe that's a good sign. People are paying attention. And I also happen to like your podcast. Change that rating system. Get a better mic. And, and I, I think that I think you'll be on your way. But at one point, I am going to, I am going to crash your podcast, Andrew. Okay, moving on. Uh, some quick plugs. First plug is uh, I want to do a, a plug for a podcast that I can't crash every week. And one, uh, the one this week is Throwing Shade. Uh, Throwing Shade, they don't have guests on the show. It's comedian Aaron Gibson, another comedian. uh, He describes himself as homosexual Brian Safi. I think he's gay. I'm I'm pretty sure that he's gay. And I wonder, is it, if you have a last name and your last name is Safi and you're gay, is that a, is that a bad thing? Can that be made fun of? If, if someone who's gay makes fun of someone else who's gay, what do they even call each other? I mean, do they, you know, do they use the, do they use the F word amongst each other? What would, what would a gay person, if they're teasing someone, how would they, what would they say to someone else who's gay? This, is, this seems like a paradox. This, I, the, anyways, Aaron Gibson and Brian Safi do this podcast, and it's hilarious. I'm addicted to it. I've listened to almost every episode of it. I love it. They don't have guests. They talk about news stories, and it's basically improv uh, comedy, and they're great. You should check out that podcast. Okay, so here's some stuff that I'm up to real quick. I will be hosting, actually, this week, uh, What's Trending. If, you, if you've watched the show, it's an online show uh, called What's Trending. It's a live show. I'm hosting it this week. Uh, that's Wednesday, April, what is that? Wednesday, April 18th. 
I think. Is that 18? Yes. Wednesday, April 18th, I am hosting What's Trending. Go to whatstrending.com and check that out. Uh, a couple of other things. I am doing the Holy Fuck Comedy Show on Tuesday, April 24th. That's at the 9 p.m. at the Downtown Independent Theater, 251 South Main Street in Los Angeles. Come check that out. It's a free comedy show. So I don't know who's in the lineup, but, uh, but I am. That's Tuesday, April 24th, 9 p.m. Uh, stand- you get to see some of my stand-up comedy. And then also I'll be at the Catalina Film Festival the weekend of May 4th through 6th. Um, Stan Lee is a special guest at the festival, and he will be uh, doing a special screening of The Avengers. And then I'll be having a one-on-one conversation with Stan Lee, one of my heroes growing up. That's May 4th through 6th. And next week I'm going to be giving away tickets to the Catalina Film Festival. So you'll definitely want to tune in to find out how to win those tickets to the Catalina Film Festival. You go to Catalina, what is this site? Catalinafilm.org. Catalinafilm.org for that. Uh, You can get information on the Holy Fuck Comedy Show, holyfuckcomedy.com, and What's Trending, go to whatstrending.com. Okay, those are the plugs for this week. Now let's get to, uh, before we get to the film threat crash, I'm really building this up. It really this is this is one I put off too. It's 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 emotional for me because it's uh, something that's near and dear to my heart. Something I've been affiliated with for a long time. Um, but uh, something I want to talk about uh, related to the world of podcasting and related not just to people who are uh, who do this, but also who people people who are fans of podcasts, and that is iTunes. iTunes has this thing, you know, you can go on iTunes and what can you look up? You can look up movies, you can look up music, you can look up audiobooks, you can look up, there's so many, there's apps, you can, you can purchase many things through the iTunes store. And there are all these different sections and every week, here's the new products. I mean, it's a, it's a, obviously a digital store. You would look, I don't need to explain how iTunes works to any of you because you're listening to this, you probably know about iTunes. But you know that iTunes has several different sections for the kinds of media that you're looking for, whether it be music, movies, or Okay, so you go to the podcast section, and when you look there, and you're looking at all of the various types of podcasts that you can, you can discover, it's pretty much always the same ones are, are, are sort of ranked at the top. Now, my understanding is, is that there's some algorithm that uh, iTunes uses uh, to... Fuck. Whoa, 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 whoa. Sorry, too soon. That was, that was the drums of war. I'm actually not there yet. But uh, iTunes has this algorithm where how it determines um, what are the top podcasts on iTunes um, when, when they're ranked in different categories. And it has to do with new subscribers and number of downloads and number of posted reviews and comments. A uh, quick aside, I decided actually to post a new episode of Pod Crash before I had reached. I said I was going to wait until I reached 100 reviews posted on iTunes before I would um, put up the new episode of Pod Crash. I decided I don't want to hold this show hostage from my listeners, I, so I apologize for that because this system is flawed. I received a number of uh, t- you know, uh, messages from listeners of the show, like Jeff Shaw, who's a longtime listener, and uh, among others, who said, look, I posted a review weeks ago. It never appeared. I didn't use foul language or hateful language. I just posted a review. It didn't show up. Other people said they did the same thing. I even tried it myself, and I gave myself a fair review. Let me be honest. I gave myself a very fair review of Pod Crash, a fair assessment of how I'm doing. I give myself a B minus. I, I, it's maybe a C plus. Anyways, so, so, uh, uh, this 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 is a flawed thing. So I decided I'm just going to post this, post the episode. Forget that for now. Something more important is happening, and it needs to be addressed. And that is how podcasts are ranked and featured on iTunes. Here's the issue: iTunes recently posted a poll on Facebook, and if you go to facebook.com/podcrash, you will find I, I have the the poll up there, and they're asking which comedy podcast would you like to see featured on iTunes. And you can select from, let's see, The Adam Carolla Show. Okay. It's, 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 I love Adam Carolla. I've read his book. I, it's, I, it's, I like that guy. Uh, Smodcast, which I guess Smodcast, I don't say which Smodcast. Is it, doesn't, it have, doesn't Kevin Smith have 900 podcasts? Smodcast, which, which, what, which of the Smodcast? Okay, so Smodcast in general. Look, I love Kevin. I, lo- I love, uh, I've, I have th- all of his films. And Red State, highly underrated film. Uh, Nerdist. Nerdist, you can also choose Nerdist. WTF with Mark Maron. And the Joe Rogan Experience. Okay, Adam Smodcast, Nerd, Nerdist, WTF, and Joe Rogan Experience. So, also there's another choice. Other. You can vote for Other. 
Now, the thing I found sort of distressing about this is iTunes is asking, well, which comedy podcast do you want to have featured? The ones that they give you the choices of from the specific podcast, those are already big podcasts. Those are already podcasts that pretty much are always in the top five, if not the top ten, and they're just sort of jockeying for position. And they've been there for at least over the last year, maybe two years. And I have nothing against these podcasts. I'm a fan of, of these podcasts. It's, it's just that it's almost like when you go to the – if you went to the movie theater and the same movie was playing, the same five movies were playing for the last year, you'd get annoyed. You would get a little irritated. Why should these be the only choices that I have? You mean I can only pick from these five that are already in the top five? This makes no sense to me. So I am going to encourage you to go to facebook.com slash podcrash. Like my page if you want, but, but vote in this poll. There's a, there's a link to the poll. Vote other. In the comments, you can actually leave what podcast from the other you would like to see featured. I just think that there should be an up-and-coming podcast, not necessarily mine, just anything, anything other than the ones we've already seen. It's, it's almost like it's in a way – as much as like all of these, all podcasts are indie. They're all done independently. There aren't any big distributors for podcasts. The big distributor, really, the, the access is via iTunes. And what they're saying is choose from among the five comedy podcasts that are already in the top five to be featured on iTunes, which I, I don't know what they mean by features. That could be featured on the front page. Look, this is a new medium, and I think that, that, that you know, we're all kind of figuring this out. I'm definitely figuring this out. I appreciate you being with me on this journey of figuring out how to do a podcast. But, but I, I, I just think that, that iTunes could, could reach down from among the smaller um, podcasts that are doing great work. Maybe something like Throwing Shade. I'm a big fan of Throwing Shade. And, and just something else, uh, because these, those other podcasts, they don't need any help. The, the sort of newer podcasts or the up-and-coming podcasts, I think those are the ones that actually should get some kind of play. So vote other. Hey, tweet it out. Hashtag vote other. Just vote for an uh, vote for a different podcast. Ah, there it's again. I'm not ready. Okay, so so look, if you want if you want media uh, diversified, if you want to have a lot of choices, then you need to discover new podcasts. I can't be the only one doing it with this show. Um, iTunes, I think, should find some other way of revolving uh, newer podcasts in so people can be made aware of them. Um, certainly, you know, uh, Joe Rogan and, and Hardwick with Nerdist and, and Kevin Smith and, and, and Mark Marin and, and Corolla, they built up audiences over this time and they sort of solidified those positions. But like I said, I, I, if you you know if if a, my movie theater played the same five movies for a year, I'd be sick of them, and I sort of drift in and out of listening to those podcasts. But I'd like to discover new ones. I think that you would like to discover new ones too. So now I'm ready. This is my formal declaration of war. We've seen the war on Christmas. We've seen the war on women, and now. This is perhaps the most important war of all. The war on the top podcasts. I'm sick of them. I'm sick of the top five always being the top five. Let's have some diversity. Some diversity in our media. There are other podcasts out there to discover. Look look below that top five. Look down, maybe down to the bottom hundred. That's kind of where I'm lingering at. Look at those podcasts. Subscribe to any of those. Subscribe to mine. Subscribe to... Throwing Shade or Proudly Resents or Tower of Sour or, or Podcast Squared, anything, something else, some kind of diversity, something other than the top five that are always in the top five. And let's take a look at these top five for a second. The Joe Rogan Experience. Okay, Joe, a great comedian. The guy even knows martial arts. But look, you, I mean, he's never written a book. You can't punch a book into existence, Joe. And WTF with Mark Marin. Hey, Mark, with all your success now, are you happy? Because that makes you far less interesting if, if you're happy. I, I wish you happiness, but, but I like you when you're miserable. But for the period of this war, I will not like you. I will not like you, Mark Marin. And Nerdist, Chris Hardwick, a former, former colleague of mine at, at G4. I, for, I, I feel weird even using the word nerd now. I'm going to switch to geek. I am not going to use the word nerd during this period of war. 
And I wish you all the success with your Nerdist network, which is a lot like G4, let's be honest. Uh, but I actually, have an, I actually have an idea. A total aside, while I'm doing this formal declaration of war, I actually think that I could cr launch a network on YouTube that would be more successful than the Nerdist network. It would be called, it would be the Retardist Network. And it would be where I get mentally challenged people and I would film them watching all the shows on the Nerdist Network. I think that would actually get a lot of ratings, like, like the Whack Pack or something, watching the Nerdist shows and then commenting, you know, live commenting on all of the shows. I'm not going to say the word nerd during this period. I will only use the word geek and Smodcast, Kevin Smith. I, I, my biggest complaint about you is we never get enough of you. Why don't you start some more podcasts? There should be more Kevin Smith podcasts. Why aren't all top 10 of all of the podcasts Kevin Smith's modcasts? And Adam Carolla, a man who barely graduated high school. And I'm just, honestly, I'm saying this. I'm a guy who, barely, you know, I didn't finish college. So what am I, what am I saying? And I happen to think, I read your book, Adam. And by read, I mean I listened to you read it to me, which I, which I quite enjoyed. But you're kind of dominating the space here. You're doing five podcasts a week, five daily podcasts, you're always in the top, you're, always, you're number one. Step aside for a moment. This is like, you know, this is boring. You know, like when the Patriots ever win a Super Bowl, that's boring. Or when any team dominates a sport, Yankees, I'm sick of it. I want to see other podcasts get their day in the sun. I want to, I want you to scream it. Vote other. Go to, go to Facebook. Find this iTunes poll. It's on my page, facebook.com slash podcrash. Vote other. Put something in the comments about any other podcast than any of those five. Join me in this honorable war. The war to bring diversity, choice, and freedom to podcasts on iTunes. Vote other. Okay, enough of that. Uh, I appreciate you joining me in this war. It's actually just voting. In this war, uh, the, your way of fighting, just vote other on facebook.com slash podcrash. Look at that poll. Vote other. Uh, but, but thank you for participating. I think it's actually a worthy cause. I, although my idea for the Retardist Network, I actually think, I think it's a valid idea to actually get, except I, you know what might be funnier is actually use jocks. Get a bunch of jocks in a room, some, some real jocks, and force them to watch shows from the Nerdist Network and record their, their on, ongoing comments. You know, kind of like you're sitting next to someone watching a TV show who always makes comments while you're, you can't watch the show. You've got to like listen to their, their stupid remarks. So the stupid, you hear a lot of stupid remarks from jocks watching the Nerdist Network. I, I would watch that. I would watch that show in a heartbeat. That and some more cat videos. Okay, so on to this week's crash. Film Threat, as you know, is a, a website, and I was affiliated with it. It started as a fanzine, magazine, website. I was affiliated with it for 25 years, started it as a kid. Mark Bell is now the owner, publisher, and um, I, I actually sold Film Threat to Mark Bell. Mark was a guy I met. Um, he... Uh, knew him around uh, the Slam Dance Film Festival, met him there, and then and then he, yeah, I actually hired him to do research for the data portion of my film festival book, and he did an amazing job. I said, hey, you should you should do some writing for film threat. You should work with me on film threat. There's a couple things uh, I think that you'd be good at. So then Mark, it sort of evolved into the editor in chief of, of film threat in that time. And uh, then he went off to New Zealand to actually be with his, his girlfriend who was studying in New Zealand. He left, he left Film Threat and went there. And, and the things kind of just like, it, it was something where I had been doing it for a long time and I was trying to branch my career off in another direction, which I have to say, it's sort of like taking a giant battleship and doing a 180. You know, I'm trying to now do uh, stand-up, more, more writing, and doing, I'm developing, you know, animated shows and com comedy shows. And um, this was after I, I, I made this feature comedy, my big fat independent movie. I'm trying to make stuff rather than actually be the guy that covers stuff. And I'm still kind of stuck in it. But changing a career in that direction, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's, it's difficult while also remaining responsible. And by responsible, I mean actually paying bills. So um, I told Mark, you know, hey, you know what? I'm going to make a big announcement at Sundance. I'm going to come to Sundance. I'm going to do this book signing. At the book signing, I'm going to announce that I am closing the doors of Film Threat. It's been 25 years. I'm going to shut the site down. 
I'm going to shut the site, site down and I'm just going to throw up an archive and it'll be like, here it is for, for history's sake, filmthreat.com. Mark said, hey, how much to buy film threat? He texts me. I said, uh, I don't know, for you, this much. He says, okay, let's talk. I ended up being 30 minutes late to this book signing because Mark and I stood in the alley negotiating the terms of him taking film threat over. And I got up at that book signing and I actually made this announcement. I said, after 25 years, I'm, I'm walking away from film threat. I'd like to introduce to you the new owner and publisher, Mark Bell. He came up on stage. I nearly lost it. I mean, I really did. I just got all emotional. I mean, it's something that's, that I feel is, has been a part of me for a long time. I mean, more than half my life. So, I, you know, Mark and I did a very manly hug. And uh, and he he took over he took over Film Threat, and I have to say about Mark he's one of those guys that during the course of our working together at Film Threat it wasn't just work we get together and like hey man come over uh, early uh, so we can watch some videos or like come over like let's let's hang out like um, are you gonna be doing Rock Band tonight because why don't we just play this so we were more than coworkers we were friends and he's also the kind of rare friend that um, I mean he helped me through some of the darkest periods of my life. Uh, helped me through uh, my divorce, um, helped me through, like, um, I mean, he was incredibly, uh, I mean, he was like an uncle to my kids. He was also a friend that, um, you know, when I got into other kinds of trouble, this is the guy that saved me. Um, and, uh, I, as, you know, there's a, a handful of people I can count that have been like that to me. I mean, he really is like the brother I never had. Um, the brother, who, he looks much better in facial hair than I ever could. And um, I, I really love Mark and, and, you know, and would do anything to support this guy with film threat. I do, I do have some, some words of advice for him regarding film threat, but that's at the, that's at the end of the show. Let's listen, let's listen to this, this uh, film threat uh, podcast, um, which was recorded uh, after Mark had, had, had gotten, taken the reins of film threat, came over to my place. And in my garage, I've got all the old files of film thread. I've got the boxes of stuff, and and uh, we went through it, and and so he could grab all these things and 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 embark on on this new business venture under new management, so to speak. And uh, I said, let's just record a podcast. So Mark set up a mic. Uh, we talked some some of the material. I mean, this was recorded in 2010. Uh, some of it's relevant now. Some of it uh, uh, you'll find interesting. But give it a listen. I have some comments in between, too. Just a few here and there. Here it is, Film Threat with Mark Bell. All right, welcome to the Film Threat podcast. Uh, this is Mark Bell, the owner and publisher of Film Threat, and I have a very special guest this week. Uh, normally we have contributing editor Don Lewis with us, but uh, not this time because he's a jackass. So we brought in the original jackass, uh, founder of Film Threat, Chris Gore. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> what? I, that's what I'm supposed to say, right? Hello? and I think you're supposed to say, yeah, welcome. just say hello. Th- this, this is so formal, though. We've just been sitting, hanging out. But that's the idea, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we, we don't have an agenda here today, people. We're just uh, going to be talking about things. But I, just to get the bad news out of the way, like just to talk about it real fast, is we just found out, like minutes ago, Gen Art shut down, which is just sad. Yeah, because they had like the best parties. They did. Well, that was their entire, um, what do you call it? Modus operandi. It's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was like seven parties, seven premieres. That was Gen Art New York. The but. festival was a great excuse to have a party. Yeah, it was what most festivals are. But uh, look, just, it's, it's just sad to see you know fest like Cine Vegas. I think you know yeah. shutting down for taking a year off. I, you know, I'm I'm curious to see if they'll actually come back. But I'm um, you know it, it's 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 tragic to see some of these festivals go away that they can't just dial it back I, I think part of the problem is a lot of these festivals grow too quickly yeah you know um i think that was the problem with cine vegas they built an infrastructure that they couldn't support i mean they easily could have just do, done a weekend rather than you know um having it be the 10 day event that it was it, right. the, the long event it didn't need to be i think their last year big. or two was 5 days i think their last right. year was 5 days yeah cine vegas set a bar that was just it was a very hard bar to match every right. year. Even like, even to dial it back. I mean, they don't yeah. do things small in Vegas. No, not at all. And that's and, and that's the thing. That's why they they stopped is because they don't want to dial it back. They want to be able to continue and, and hit that mark that they set for themselves. So I understand it. I heard at Sundance that it's going to be back next year. Well, so great podcast, Mark. To start off with depressing news. This really sucks. I'm sad now. 
Well, yeah, that's the entire idea. I wanted to, I wanted to bring it down, bring it down, make everybody nice and quiet. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. Okay. And then, I'm bummed out. So, talking about festivals uh, that are still around, uh, the LA Film Festival just announced its uh, its lineup, and uh, you you had a chance to look at the lineup. Yes, I did. And and what what movie are you waiting for? Well, what's the one that you really well, want to see? The, the the movie I'm most excited about is The People vs. George Lucas. Right. And it's not just because I'm in the movie, because, right. just so you know, I'm in the movie. It's uh, a documentary about um, fandom sort of revolt against George Lucas and, and the way he's treated his fans um, kind of like an, an abusive uh, a, abusive father would treat right. a child and breaking his toys. I mean, it's, it's – so, but really, to me, it's, it's more of a – it's it, – it, it's kind of a love letter to Lucas in a way because he recreated in a way fandom, right. and I and I, I and and I think it's the best film about the world of fandom because even me, I'm watching myself in this movie. I'm going, this is kind of ridiculous, right? That in, that you know, these are the kind of nerd conversations yeah. where you end up losing your voice about the you know second day in at Comic Con and getting into detail about who shot first, right. Greedo or Han Solo, which you know we all know was Han Solo. Of course. And it's, will remain so in the copies of Star Wars that I have in, in my collection. Well, and also you, uh, I, I mean, I said this after I saw it at South by Southwest, which is watching that movie was kind of like just watching the same people I already know, having yeah. conversations I've already had. Yeah. You know, usually with those people. But it was such a well-done documentary, visually speaking. I mean, yes. one thing when I was talking to the director uh, about it was just like, don't make this a talking heads. Like, so many yeah. documentaries fail at making it talking heads, and it's just so visually amazing. Um, and also the stuff that he dug up. I mean, there's like interviews with George Lucas in the early seventies from shows I've never even heard of where he, and you can see where he contradicts himself, you know, yeah. sort of setting himself on one path and, and then on another, it's, it's a, it's a really great documentary and I'm just happy that it's going to have an LA premiere and get a lot of attention. I just hope that George Lucas would see this movie and then just consider, look, he can have all the special editions he wants. Just preserve the history of the original star Wars. Don't rewrite the history. Yeah. And I think the, I think the documentary is, uh, what do you call it, reverent enough. It's not like, yeah. they, they're not pissing on George Lucas. Like, they bring up the points against him, but also, it's a very measured documentary. Like, I actually thought it was a lot kinder yeah. than, than when I first heard the idea for it, when they were first asking for people for interviews, like, years ago. Right. Like, I was like, really? We're going to do a documentary well, about people whining about Star Wars? The title is very provocative, but it's, I, I, I think it's, it's presented in a balanced and fair way, but you get to hear both sides. I mean, I, 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 I really love it. Can't wait to see it again in L.A. Awesome. But then also the L.A. Film Festival is playing the new Twilight movie. That's right. And let's be honest, this is why film festivals to exist. It's to help smaller movies that need that need a little push into yeah. the marketplace so that there can be more awareness of it. And I just hope that this second Twilight movie... Be a third one. Third one, whatever. Was, I mean, I don't know. Oh, it's the third one. That's right, it is the third one. <laughs> I don't keep oh my track. God. I don't know what's I never on. saw the first one in the theater, but I had to see it for work. First one's hilarious. I So I, I, the thing is, is, it's to help small films like the new Twilight movie gain an awareness among people who go to film festivals. Yeah, no, it's... Uh, it's Without using the term bait and switch, it's kind of what it is. It's like you, you, it's kind of a captive audience. You bring them in with the big movie, and then while they're there, you can kind of preach to them while they're in your box. Well, yes, obviously I'm being sarcastic. I think that it sucks that Twilight has taken a slot from some other filmmaker. However, it does serve the purpose of of, of actually bringing more attention to the festival and see how well it worked out for San Diego Comic-Con when it attracted all the Twilight fans there. Maybe the same thing will happen with festivals. Maybe young girls... All the little, the, you know, the tweens, the little young girls that love the Twilight and those sort of Twilight moms. You know, those cougars that would like to have sex with a young emo boy. Vampire. M- maybe, maybe that audience will discover another movie at a festival. Like, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm just imagining. I'm, I'm trying to think of anything positive. I'm imagining probably... some of the movies I've seen at film festivals and just watching that audience, like, kind of walk into something like, uh, I don't know, like a Serbian film. Or yes, or something like that. The like, Serbian like, oh, film. I wonder what that's about. They're having sex with a baby. That would not be yeah. a rape. 
whatever. Yeah. A lot of, lot of, a lot of rape. The, the, you just see the this, subject you... matter at festivals. When it comes to narrative features, the subject matter for movies at festivals are so depressing. It's not cheerful. It's yeah. There's, there's not a lot of comedies. Well, I love the not docu- a lot of fun. I love the documentaries, and I always found most documentaries kind of end with me wanting to put a gun to my head. Well, yeah. It's it's like when I get back from Sundance, I think you know what? It's another Sundance. It's made incest fun again. As I listen to this, I'm reminded that uh, a lot of a lot of film festivals are actually on hard times. I mean, from sponsorships and whatnot. And I really think that the that the internet um, has been a big part of that. I think that if you're a filmmaker and you are looking for exposure, um, I'm not sure if a film festival is going to be your first choice. Um, I, I, it's 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 sad to say this, but but it was at the time like oh internet you know a few people will see it, but you really want to make your contacts face to face. I think that's also true, um, but but the internet gets gets you so much instant feedback um, and can help you actually build an audience. Where I was I was talking to an indie filmmaker recently. I said, look, I said you could make this as an indie movie. You could spend a couple years on it. You could take it on the festival circuit, and you could you could see what happens with that or you could take your indie movie and just turn it into an app. I almost feel like that would be take the content that is your independent film, chop it up into little bits, turn it into an app that you can download, and that would probably get more attention than you would taking it to a film festival. I, it's sad for me to even say that, but I think that that's kind of what it's come to. If you're looking to reach a wide audience, um, the internet, uh, the internet is where to go for indie filmmakers. Anyways. Okay, back to the podcast. Anyway, so uh, last night, well, let's let's preface this. Spoilers, yes. spoilers are going to abound for the next however long this conversation lasts. But last night, you and I went and saw uh, Iron Man two. Iron Man two. Yes, so we saw it. You know, okay, let's go back to the first Iron Man. <laughs> let's go back to the first Iron Man. For you second. mean where logic prevailed? Yeah, there I was, loved the first Iron Man. I had no expectations for the first Iron Man. I think I saw it just for the hell of it. Um, and so it pleasantly surprised me. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. was amazing. It was a lot of fun to watch. And so going yes. into this one, keep going, going into this one, yes. I was similarly lowered the expectations. I went in saying, you know what? If I go in saying, I hope this is just like the first one, I'm just going to let myself down. So I'm just going to go in like I did the first time. I mean, it's no imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, but go on, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> There's no unobtainium. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> there kind of is triangulum. But anyway, yes. yeah, no, that's right, Triangulum. Anyway, so uh, spoilers, there's spoilers. There's spo- we're giving it spoilers. away right now. There's spoilers. So uh, we went last night, and um, I'm glad that we went together. So we sat there next to each other, commenting throughout the movie. Well, the comments basically were a series of expressions along the lines of "What? What the fuck?" and "Huh?" <laughs> My though, though there were moments where it's like. Like, where basically the movie takes it out of, like, bits from Real Genius, and uh, the end solution for beating the bad guy is crossing the streams from Ghostbusters. So it's it, it kind of borrows quite heavily from a lot of places. But True. Chris feels far more passionately what? about this movie one way or the other than I do, so I'm going to let him uh, give what? his thoughts. Well, I was, first of all... Um, I'm, I was colossally disappointed. I thought that I thought that I thought that the action actually was better in this, but defied logic. You know, I mean, he basically he's wearing uh, a, a suit that shoots missiles and can kill people. This is not. I mean, it, it, they, I don't think they took that as seriously as they should have. Um, and then and then there was just sort of just logic holes you could drive a truck through. I mean, it was just like insane logic holes. Um, and what's, it was interesting to know in advance that, that, um, a lot of the dialogue was improvised. They needed a scene here. They needed a scene there. The script wasn't complete when they started shooting. They had to meet a, they had to, typical of uh, Hollywood movies today. They know the release date before production even starts. And, right. and who knows if they're going to, you know, that, that doesn't allow for, if there are problems that exist, they, they can go back and fix them. There's no time, you know? Um, so, so they were making some of it. It's really clear in some of the scripts scenes that they are some of the dialogue is just so you know they're they're improving and they're trying to get this stuff and it doesn't work i'm sorry robert downey jr had had way too much leeway um in this to kind of be crazy tony stark it doesn't work folks and and what's funny though is the technique that they used 
to actually shoot this movie where it's like we don't have a script. We're just going to shoot the action scenes and everything else first and then go back and kind of make a story out of this is the, exactly the way that Kirby and Lee used to do comic books in Marvel comic uh, when they worked for Marvel in the 60s. Right. Is Stan Lee would say something like, I don't know, a giant cloud comes and like his herald and then he's on a surfboard and then there's a thing and the Fantastic Four fight a thing, the creature that comes down from the sky, blah, blah, blah. Jack would come back with pages drawn of just fight scenes and spaces where dialogue would exist and Stan Lee would then go in and fill in the story and fill in the dialogue and that's that's how they did Marvel it's Comics. Like Mad Libs. Yeah, it was, it was, it was like Mad Libs where, where Stan Lee would come up have like a basic outline of the story they talk to Jack Kirby with or Jack Kirby would actually come up with ideas Kirby would come in with the art done, leaving space and little balloons, make a couple corrections, but then Stan Lee would just fill in dialogue and make a story. That's kind of how they made Iron Man, and I'll just say that having seen this now, it doesn't work for a film as, as well as it works for the graphic novel medium. That's interesting, because it's like, it worked for the comic book. I'm going to tweet that, but I'm going to have to cut 9,000 words. Right, <laughs> exactly. Basically, it's going to be, like, Iron Man 2 did not deliver. Yes. I, 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 the, well, the, the, the thing tweet. is, some stuff worked. I thought the special effects were better in the sense that they looked less digital. Mm -hmm. So it was less looked like CGI, more looked like, yes, that's a guy in a suit. He's wearing that suit. He's walking around. He's, Do you he's really in think the world. someone was wearing a suit? Well, no. Well, it no, just he, looked that way. Yeah, yeah no. I mean, yeah, he yeah, had okay. the suit. He, I mean, he did. Like, they've, they've had stills of it. I mean, like, he, there is a suit that exists. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Look around. Look around. There's suits. He has a suit. There is a suit. Right, no. Made it forever. It's not a digital, yeah, it's not all digital. I'm sure yeah. it's digitally enhanced, but but um, there were just so many logic holes, you know, his his re relationship with Rhodes and... Well, and you didn't like his character. Like, you didn't like, you felt he was overly narcissistic, like, to, like, a degree that was yeah. not even entertaining. Tony Stark wasn't likable like he was in the first film, where you're like, oh, okay, I kind of feel for him. In this, he's sort of a pompous, arrogant prick. And, and you go after a while, it's like, well, you know, when does he, like get real and set, and, and just his the, the thing you find out is that Tony Stark is dying right. he's dying and, and and so that's no excuse to, to be an asshole um, I kind of he, he really I would argue that's me. the only excuse to be an yeah, asshole but he, but he kind of lost me I kind of just didn't like his character right. and then Rhodes come in makes no sense he's supposed to be his friend steals one of the Iron Man suits get, gets it sort of tweaked with by Sam Rockwell's character Sam Rockwell's character makes no sense and Mickey Rourke is just ridiculous and and this there's supposed to be some oh, you know all, I know these other problems these other problems are solved so quickly like oh he's dying well let's just give him a shot right, shield right. gives him a shot and then he's fine yeah. that makes no sense and and here go easy. figure out a new element for the periodic table your dad almost figured it out and yeah. like there's a weird kind of forced subplot in there with like right. Tony and his dad and. And, and, like, his dad was mean to him, and he's he's holding a grudge, and that's part of his character development. And then, like, there's, like, long lost, almost lost from, like, the TV show right. film footage of his dad being like, Tony, I can't figure this out. The technology's not there yet. But you will. I always loved you, son. Like, something like that. And it's, like, real. You wouldn't film it, I, I guess. But what was funny, too, was the crowd reaction. People did not cheer. There were there were very few, che you know, moments for an audience to really get behind what was happening on screen when, and when cheer. When the Black Widow, when Scarlett Johansson kicked the guard's ass, a lot of people got into that. That, okay, I, I will say this. On the positive side, Scarlett Johansson's character is the standout. I would have seen an entire movie with just her. I mean, I, I'd like, in fact, I'd like to see her and Hit Girl, although it would be illegal in most countries, a video of the two of them going at it because that, I mean, kicking and fighting. I was just going to say, it's, it wouldn't be illegal if they were fighting. D exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, my thoughts on Iron Man 2, uh, it's, it's, oh God, it was, it's just, all, the, all of this is a buildup to the Avengers, which I have not yet seen. I am one of the few people, the few people at my work who have, who have not seen the Avengers yet, uh, but I'm very excited to see it with Stan Lee uh, in the weekend it opens. Um, I, it's a big fan of these Marvel movies, but what's funny is, is how, how lost the source material is. I mean, there are kids watching these movies today that think, d d d it's cool that they're making movies from these video games that I've played. Uh, so whatever I I can't wait to see the Avengers and that's what all all these Marvel movies have just been a prequel to the Avengers let's get back to the podcast and the thing is, is as confused as our conversation about Iron Man 2 is Iron Man 2 is as confused as this conversation right. from a plot standpoint there's no build up to this and and it opens with mickey rourke being really mad at clips of tony stark being successful i, I think the biggest and, and so it's this dark ang you know sort of 
you know, bizarre scene to open where you're just like, you want to cheer Iron Man too. Yeah. yeah. And, but it's like, no, this dark kind of creepy thing. And which kind of leaves a weird tone to begin the film with it. The, the, I think it was the wrong scene to open the movie with. They easily could have flopped a few things around. Well, I mean the basic, the basic premise and conceit of Iron Man two of just basically an arms race. Once you introduce a weapon, kind of like the whole thing with like uh, Dr. Manhattan and Watchmen. It's like, once you have a weapon, Everybody else tries to come up with a weapon to beat that weapon. Right. You know, so, like, the entire Iron Man 2 is just, like, we have this weapon. Other people are obviously going to come up with a way to make this weapon. We need to get make our weapon better. And Iron Man shouldn't be the only one that has it. So that's, like, the basic premise of it. From there, it gets silly. Um, I, I really think a lot of the film, because I thought the action scenes were pretty amazing. I think that... Um, a lot of well, the, it was like I said, action figures slamming against each other. That's pretty much all it is. It's, yeah, a bunch of action figures slamming against each other. I, you know, but but um, a lot of the problems could have been solved with some just more careful editing, and just probably a couple of reshoots. But but wow, does it show how important writing is? I mean, yeah. I, I mean, writing is such a critical. I I think that the, I mean the, the best. I, I really think that the best filmmakers today are actually coming from television, mm. because because I think that. Um, television every week, you get the opportunity. If you're in that writer's room or whatever, you, you get an opportunity to you write an episode of a show, and six months later or so, or less than that, it airs, mm -hmm. and you get feedback in the form of ratings and fan reaction. You get you, Feedback is, is like air to a writer. You want to get feedback, both good and bad. It, 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 right. it, it helps build up those writing muscles. And I feel like when having worked in – writers that have worked in television and then go on to make films, writer-producers normally is – that you know, J.J. Abrams came from that. Yeah. Joss Whedon, um, you know that that gives you an opportunity to exercise those writing muscles, and I think that you develop better instincts. The problem with screenwriters, Hollywood screenwriters, is you write a script and maybe seven years later it'll get made. Right. And between the seven years, you've written maybe nine screenplays if you haven't quit and moved back to Oklahoma. Right. So the the, the difference between a Hollywood screenwriter and a TV writer slash producer, I, I think is 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 dramatic, and I think I think it, I think you're seeing some of the best work come from people from television. To me, the the better writing is on TV, and then movies is sort of a mixed bag. You can do spectacle in film, but but definitely don't go to movies for good writing. For um, I guess looking at it under the uh, under the situation which existed, which was you know you have this movie which because the first one was so successful the second one was kind of green lit and let's go 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 let's make it right. here's our date you know like we're going to we're going to make it in 2 years this is how it's going to happen Favreau's on he's not on who's directing it he is who's writing it you know what i mean like sort of thing considering everything that went into that and the rush production and the knowledge of how they they do this every single time there's a money maker was iron man 2 good considering those circumstances no. Okay. I'm sorry. I mean, I think I, I definitely. I think we were talking last night. It's like it's like a C. Right. Unfortunately, I, I and I really wanted to love it because I thought the first one was a surprise. It's sort of a B level character. Um, you know, would it work today? And they made it relevant. They made it work. I think the biggest mistake story wise was Tony Stark revealing that he's Iron Man. I think the secret identity thing. There's a reasoning. I mean, like you're watching all the problems in the film stem from him not having a secret identity. Right. The fact that he revealed himself because he's got such a big ego, right. it should have been something, it should have been a flop where they start the movie and it's like, oh, I was just kidding. It's but like Tony Stark was tragic. drunk. Yeah, they could have they could have continued the press conference from, from the end of Iron Man 1. Which they, they kind of tried had, to do. They, and, and then had Iron Man and Iron Man land <laughs> and, and, and basically, basically someone trying to save it. Who knows? It's, it's, it's Pepper inside the Iron Man costume trying to save him from like, look, if you if you reveal yourself as being Iron Man, you make yourself a target. Yeah. And and I, I think that this whole thing is it just didn't work. And also, I don't know. I'm not into the comics canon, so I don't know about the canon for Iron Man, folks. It was not it was not my go-to comic. My gateway comics were things like I read X Men, I read Fantastic Four, yeah, it was certain X -Men. certain runs of those I would read depending on who was writing it. And then of course, you know, the Watchmen, Dark Knight, all that stuff. Yeah, you know, the, the classics. But when it came to Iron Man, you know, he'd, he'd appear in other comics that I read. I and knew I was he familiar, existed. And I was familiar with the origin, but I'm not familiar with the history. I don't know if Tony Stark actually did reveal himself. But I think all the problems in the movie, and they're not interesting problems. Right. They're not interesting. Maybe they just wanted to go a different way. Like, well, we've seen the secret identity superhero. Let's not do that. Let's go a different way. Right. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um. 
it, it really just it creates a whole set of problems that that are unnecessary. And I think it, it would have been more exciting for him to hang on to that secret identity um, and try to because anyone that would be revealed to be that, don't you think that would be a target, right? Well, exactly. But, well, he's not in his costume. Shoot him. It, 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 when, when he gets to the expo at the beginning and he takes he's out of his suit and he's standing there in his business suit. I'm like, does that, is there security? Because right. a sniper could end this right now. Yeah. Like, that, that entire movie could have been over if uh, Whiplash, instead right. of walking out onto a uh, race course and, like, getting in kind of a fight, just would have, like, pulled a pistol out and just walked up to him. It's not like he's protecting himself. Right. You know, he's kind of just being like, hey, I'm Iron Man. I can do whatever. Check it out. Like, just walk up and shoot him. Well, the one thing, the other funny surprise was um, Favreau in the movie. I thought Favreau oh, was funny. I think they did I a thought good, he was funny. I think he did a good job of utilizing himself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he did, you know, he was kind of there in the first Iron Man. And this, he's, he's more as sort of a bodyguard uh, he's driver. He's comic relief. He's comic relief. And, and that actually, you know, on the upside, those are things that work. Can we just watch a movie about Happy? Yeah, exactly. It's just like the, the day in the yeah. life of him. Yeah. It's like he wakes up. It's like, oh, Tony's calling. I could see that as a web series, <laughs> like a comedic web series. with just It's just about Happy and Favreau's character. There's no Iron Man in it, but no. it's all in the background, and it's the, the crap that he has to deal Shot with. Shot like 24, so there's like a clock going. Yeah. And it's like him eating cereal. Having to deal with all the, the women, you know, all of Tony's uh, conquests. and Dead hookers. Yeah, yeah, just all the shit that this guy has to clean up. Uh, I think would be pretty funny. With all this talk of uh, superhero movies, I, I, I really loved to, to see more indie comics actually made into films. I mean, it was Ghost World, of course, from Dan Klaus. I love Dan Klaus. And Art School Confidential, um, I think, is is one of those that, that people will look back on fondly. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, but I'd like to see some other ones. Uh, Yummy Fur by Chester Brown um, from Canada is one of my personal favorites. Uh, Joe Matt. I'd like to see any of the comics of Joe Matt turned in, turned into indie films. I think that would be amazing. I think, I think independent film is really missing the boat on, on the source material. When you, look at, when you look at all the movies that are in the theaters now, the source material pretty much relates to either a book or a play or a musical or uh, a comic book or just some source material that's decades old. There's hardly anything original. You can complain all you want about reboots and remakes. Even those are based on something previously, uh, previously that was created. Look at all. I think one of the only original things that I can, that comes to mind recently is uh, Inception. I mean, and then you got like you've got like you know movies based on board games, Battleship, which is coming up. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I think the the, the issue that I have with most of the mainstream studio movies they're just based on something else a toy uh, a, a video game it's, it's, it's the source material I think it's because it's so expensive uh, movie studios don't want to take the risk to put something that doesn't have sort of a built in audience already in place so um, I'd say for indie filmmakers look at the comic world you've already got you know and here, here's why that's not a bad thing you know that like you've already got a built in audience and then secondly um, it's you've already sort of had the story development I mean Chris Nolan's got uh, over 70 years of comic book history of Batman to sort of draw from to make his films, um, his Dark Knight films, and no wonder they turned out so great. A lot of those ideas are borrowed from other writers, um, and it's not taking anything away from, from putting his stamp on it. It's just saying you, you, the idea has been talked about a lot. You can pick and choose all the best stuff. Um, but I'd love to see indie film uh, spring, you know, use that idea. Use the concept of the studios. It used to be that the studios would steal stuff from indie films in terms of marketing concepts and, and uh, talent and whatnot. Now, indies, you've got to switch it up. Start looking at the studios because they've taken all of the good indie ideas. I think I, I mean I'd love to see these indie filmmakers look at comic books because hey you've got you know hundreds of issues worth of some indie comic that's been around for a long time. Let's see a Love and Rockets movie, you know. Let's see let's see some of this indie stuff actually indie comic stuff develop into indie films. It's a logical extension, you know, and then turn it into an app. That would be how it would probably get more attention than than at a film festival. Now I'm not taking anything away from film festivals. I just think that indie filmmakers have to really think think you know differently about how they they market and and get their films out there because 2012 is the year where digital downloads of movies will actually will actually uh, surpass sales of individual movies on DVD. Uh, that's right, folks. If you're someone who's a DVD collector. Um, 
get ready. The world's about to change. It's 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 now going to be a download world. Download Tuesday. Does that sound good to you? All right. Back back to this uh, final segment from Film Threat, and then I, I have some thoughts. Well, let's switch gears. Let's talk about a movie that we both actually liked. What's that? Well, exit through the gift shop. Oh yeah. Yeah, have you talked about it anywhere yet? Uh, no, no. I mean, I, just to, you know, over Twitter. Oh, yeah. yeah. Exclusive Chris Gore conversation about Exit Through the Gift yeah, Shop here yeah. on the Film Drive Podcast. It's, it's, I was um, saying, you know, it's because we have exclusively you here in this chair. Exactly. Exclusively next to me. Precisely. We should exclusively have that information. Yeah. So, no, I loved Exit, Exit Through the Gift Shop. I saw it at the Florida Film Festival. Didn't catch it at Sundance. Right. I wasn't at Sundance very long. I, but uh, <laughs> Exit Through the Gift Shop was amazing. Um I mean, just uh, this, this, the, this profile, which begins as sort of a profile of street artists that's kind of twisted into being a film about the person who initially started making the movie. Um, we're talking about Mr. Brainwash. Right. Um, I, w- but what's interesting about the film um, is I wonder how real it is. I mean, knowing Banksy, um, who hides behind a secret identity, and I don't know, like I know of street artists and, yeah. and whatnot and Shepard Ferry and, and that whole thing, but... Um, but uh, uh, Banksy, I don't know a lot about. It's because you're um, not in Britain. I'm not in Britain. Right. But um, who is Banksy? Is it a guy? Is it a bunch of people who decided to create a fake person named Banksy right. that could be blamed for some of the street art? Because uh, as was demonstrated in the movie, much of the street art to pull off requires a team of people. So Yeah, there's always, um, there's always one person who I guess you could call the artist and one or two. They're either a lookout or an assistant. There's always other people involved. It, 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 it very rarely you see a one-man team. Uh, I wonder how real that is, or did they manufacture this sort of BS person in order to sell a bunch of cheap art? Well, I mean, I think it's one of those things where, yeah, is it fake? Is it a joke? Uh, I always look at humor as humor's humor, funny's funny, a joke's a joke, regardless of whose expense. If it's a really funny joke, then I like it. Um, in this case, if it is fake, if it is a joke, if they like totally took advantage of the art world, if they took advantage of each other, however it was, it's a very good joke, Ex- and I uh, yeah. appreciate it. And on top of that, it's entertaining. I mean, it's just and, extremely entertaining. And I think, I mean, there were moments that are just so inspiring. Like as someone, you know, I do a little crafting on the side. Yeah, I do a little manly crafting. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I do a lot of modding more than more than anything. It's just you know, um, that's sort of my. That you know that that's that's my he form fixes of expression. Things. He's a fixer. I, I do a lot of weird creative things that have no point to them, but uh, which I guess you know if I can figure out a way to sell it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I like it because like to, it was inspiring. To, I'm saying it was inspiring yeah. in in that realm. Just like to be creative, to do something that really. Um, it, it, I just found that to be really. But inspiring. let's let's be honest here. To the layman, the art world is bullshit. I mean, I. Listen, I like I like a lot of the different art I saw in that movie. I like a lot of the different art I've seen throughout my lifetime. I was a studio art major in college. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, but I can't tell you why something should justify a million dollars. You know, and what I, I like about the idea of this is that it, it kind of, it's poking fun at the art world in that way. Because uh, when Mr. Brainwash decides to become an artist, you know, it's pretty much, he's not even doing the art. Right. You know, it's a team of other people. He just has the ideas for the art. Right. And then he, he hired these team of kids, uh, these other artists, basically, to work on an hourly wage to create art that, that was just sort of random mishmash. But of, that's of the idea was what was subverting the, uh, the entire art world and the right. culture. It was like, we know which buttons to press. We know if you do it kind of Andy Warhol style, and I'm guilty of this, too, because I do it on the website. Right. But it's like, you know, if you, if you keep it a little Andy Warhol style, you throw a little black and white stencil in there, maybe something that's like Andre Giant as a posse. Right. You know, like, just kind of, like, throw this different stuff in there. Make, take, a, take an image that's revered and just mess it up a little bit. Someone's going to someone's gonna find great meaning in that. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's if it's a joke, it's a good one. Yeah. The other other doc that I caught at Florida Film Festival, I highly recommend, which I was telling you about earlier, was Clean Flicks, right. which is the documentary about the uh, group of video stores run by Mormons in uh, Utah that re-edit Holly, R-rated Hollywood movies to make them uh, for general audiences. Mm. And the their, their battle against Hollywood and a lawsuit from the DGA and the results of that. And it is absolutely amazing documentary. What I do like about it, it presented both sides fairly. And I think that the problem with this, this subject is it tends to just be a knee jerk. Like, well, editing them is wrong. There's right. another side to that story. And I do like that um, the guys who made the film are former uh, Mormons. 
and they they did a great job presenting both sides fairly. What, what doc have you seen lately that that really impressed you that I haven't seen? That you haven't seen? And I'm sure there's a you lot more. You might have seen it. Uh, I was talking with Don about this uh, after the Dallas Film Festival, but uh, Waking Sleeping Beauty about the Disney animators. I have not seen that. Oh, that was amazing. Because basically what it was is, um, you know, in the 80s, Disney animation was pretty much dead. To the point where they were even bulldozing the old animation building. And it was just kind of like this perfect storm. Like, Eisner gets named CEO and co-CEO, I think, with Frank Wells was the other guy. And um, basically they bring in Jeffrey Katzenberg. And he's going to run the animation studio. And at the time, they have all these great artists there. You know, uh, what's his name? Uh, The guy from Pixar's there. Uh, God, why am I blanking on his name? Do you know it? Oh, yeah, the guy from Pixar, John Lasseter. There you go. Yeah, John Lasseter. Uh, Even Tim Burton's there. Cool. Like, it's real. But basically, this one animator just filmed the entire time he was an animator at Disney. So it's like tons of, like, really kind of inside footage of these animations that started out and led through, like, the Rescuers Down Under, which was, like, the first CG animated feature like that kind of paved the way that's that's where they bought the computers that became pixar like stuff like that and you kind of see them the arc up through the lion king wow and how like the the disney studio completely reimagined itself and saved itself basically and it's just it's incredible because um i mean for me i was a i was a kid growing up with those movies like the the early 80s on through like that that was my sweet spot for for kid movies Mm -hmm. now never mind watership down (laughs) but, yeah. you know, which was, that one's disturbing. Which I, was I, not my sweet spot, but I, I do love that oh, movie. I love Watership Down. Awesome. I Am Comic was really funny, too. Uh, tell me about that one. I Am Comic was, uh, I saw that at the Atlanta Film Festival, and that was, basically, it was a, a, as I've said before, it's like a documentary about comedians that's actually funny. Because, yeah. No, yeah, normally they're depressing. Exactly. <laughs> and this, this one isn't. <laughs> and uh, so it was just, it's just, a, it's just kind of just explores the, the comedy world and stand-up comedians in general, and and it's just, it's just, I mean, that's really at the end, all I can say about it is that it's a, com- it's a documentary about comedians that's actually funny. Well, I have another doc recommendation for you. All right, let's do it. Dumbstruck. Oh, it's, okay. It's a documentary about people who are obsessed with ventriloquist dummies and have, are trying to build a career as entertainers making money in the field of ventriloquism. Nice. And it follows a group of ventriloquists, um, one is kind of this hot chick okay. who, you know, basically uh, decides she's not going through with her wedding and she's going to seriously pursue ventriloquism and is why, trying to why get... Why do the two have to be mutually exclusive? Exactly. And she's, and she's, she's going to seriously pursue her career and the, the dream is to play um, on the, these cruise ships. That's where the big money is, is cruise ships. The, the other, and then they follow another, a kid who's like, uh, like 13, 14 years old who's, who's trying to be a serious ventriloquist and his father's like well you know he should be playing sports he definitely is going to be football seasons coming up and you see that this kid is definitely not built to play sports right and and clearly is using ventriloquism as an outlet to express how he really feels about things then there's another person who i suspect was once a man that had some correct some corrective surgery in order to become a woman right although it's never directly mentioned um a transsexual ventriloquist this is this movie is it's hilarious it also follows this guy i'm gonna forget his name um he won the i forget his name he fontaine i believe is his last name he um was the uh, america's got talent winner right and then got signed with a hundred million dollar contract at one of the vegas casinos and you see kind of his story and how he came up um as a ventriloquist and and it ends at this uh, big convention for ventriloquists. I mean, it's, I love, I love any documentary that focuses on a people who are obsessed with a particular thing and then take that sort of passion, um, just incredibly far in their lives. I love those kind of things because I kind of feel like I can relate to that in some ways with my personal obsessions, which have always gone too far. So that's it for this week's Crash Film Threat. You can follow them at Film Threat on Twitter and FilmThreat.com. And uh, you should definitely check it out, especially if you're an indie filmmaker or just someone into DIY projects. Uh, Mark Bell champions a lot of crowdfunding campaigns by filmmakers. um, And and the website reviews, they'll review anything. 
they will review absolutely anything that you send their way. And um, it's just amazing to see it exist uh, beyond my involvement. Uh, it just really, it's, it's, it's like the chocolate factory. So Charlie, Charlie is now in charge, so to speak. Um, funny thing, uh, real quick, I, I promised something at the end. Um, when it comes to leadership, my only real point of reference to um, r running something, a business or whatnot, was was the original Star Trek series and Captain Kirk. Captain Kirk was kind of this role model for me growing up watching episodes of the original show. And there's an episode of the show where everyone thinks Captain Kirk is dead. I think it's, it's the Tholian web is the episode. And Captain Kirk records a video message that he leaves behind um, for Spock and McCoy to watch um, and, and, and for him to offer sort of some final words of wisdom, some sort of guidance going forward with the Starship Enterprise without him in command. And so I have some advice for Mark Bell now that I'm no longer involved in, in Film Thread. And, and, and here's, here's what I have to say. Mark, the future of Film Threat is in your hands. She was mine for 25 years, but, but now you're captain. You sit in that captain's chair. Decisions you make will help influence the indie filmmakers of the future. The causes that you champion will affect the future of independent film and media. It's up to you to continue to support those filmmakers. Take that job seriously, but never take yourself seriously. You're pretty much already doing that, but I thought I would just mention it. Also, you might consider spinning off a personal Twitter account like Mark Film Thread or something, just so I know what Mark is up to. I get confused sometimes when I read sports scores or, you know, airport reports from the Film Thread account. I, I have no idea what's going on. Maybe it's because I'm an idiot, but think about that. Think about spinning off a completely separate Twitter account. As for the site, change it up every once in a while. Change up the design. Give it a fresh look. It's like a fresh coat of paint, or it's like uh, putting up a painting or a poster in a new room. It, it changes it up, makes it feel different. So consider a design refresh. And the podcast. I, 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 love, I love when you talk to Don. If I ever want some kids to get off my lawn, I'm going to give Don a call. Because he's so good at that. But really, I, I think that the podcast is an opportunity for you to invite other people on, other than Don. You know, Don, uh, sometimes on the Skype, uh, I, I, I can't understand what he's saying. Interview some filmmakers on the podcast. Get a portable mic. Take, take that and interview some filmmakers at festivals. You travel enough to festivals, put some of that content on the podcast. I'd really like to hear more of that. Look, you're already going in the right direction. Keep going. Never quit. Mix it up. Make it difficult for yourself. Make it hard. It's not, worth, it's not worth doing if it's not difficult. You have a huge challenge ahead with media changing and, and it's, you know, TV, the internet, that's all merging. Attendance at, at theaters is, is dropping. Film Threat now is perfectly positioned. It's a huge opportunity to show, show the world a new way of looking at, at up-and-coming filmmakers, new voices, new creative voices. Film Threat has always represented that. Continue to ignore the publicists. You and I both know most publicists are assholes. They're just there to pitch you a story and to try to manipulate you into to, to writing some puff piece about whatever it is that they're getting paid to, to, to spout at you about. Ignore them. Continue to ignore them. You pretty much already know that, but, but seek out those, those new up-and-coming indie filmmakers, those new voices. They must be heard. Continue to be the champion for those voices. Because when you look at the, 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 the movie sites out there, they're constantly giving a hand job to the studios. Don't give hand jobs to film studios. Continue to be that independent spirit, that voice for the voiceless, that voice for filmmakers who can't promote themselves because they suck at it. Champion those films. Go forth, Mark Bell. Kick some motherfucking ass.
Okay, that's it for this week's show. You can you can follow me uh, at that Chris Gore on Twitter. You can follow the show at Podcrash Show. You can even give us a good review on iTunes. I would appreciate it. But more importantly, go to Facebook.com slash Podcrash. Check out this iTunes poll and vote other. Vote other so that you can give a voice to podcasts that deserve to be heard. You know, not, not just the ones in the top five. They've had their due. They don't need the help. Smaller podcasts really need help. Smaller podcasts like Film Threat. You know, vote, uh, vote and put in the comments Film Threat. I don't care who wins in the other, just someone other than those five. You know, they, 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 they've built their huge audiences. It's time to, to give some, some other podcasts a chance. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thanks again. See you next week. One last thing. Let's get out of here. You should lead with that next time. Yeah, sorry, boss. I can only use it once. It's a one-off. Hey, if you're still listening to this, you're probably a lot like me. You're the kind of person who stays through the end credits of a movie. We're a lot alike. I like you. For that, you shall be rewarded. Send me a self-addressed stamped envelope to Podcrash with that Chris Gore, 5042 Wilshire Boulevard, PMB 1500, Los Angeles, California, 90036. And I will send you back in return something for free. It's a surprise. And this week, follow at Podcrash Show on Twitter. If you follow us, we'll follow you back. And if you DM me at Podcrash Show, and you live in the uh, Southern California area, and you would like to get tickets to the Catalina Film Festival, which will have Stan Lee and which will have uh, uh, be screening The Avengers and a lot of other cool indie films, check them out at CatalinaFilm.org. I'll get you some tickets. Just direct message me. I don't know how many free tickets I'm going to have, but uh, I'll give them away to the first people that reply. But you have to make sure you'll be in town May 4th through 6th. Free tickets to the uh, Catalina Film Festival. Kind of cool. DM me. You'll win them. Later. <laughs>